I will be reading the philosophy of life that George Washington Tabor had, and I'll read it again. I'll not only read it now, I'll also read it again, and I read it again and again, so that perhaps it can become our ethos as well. This famous quote reads as follows. No individual has any right to come into this world and go out of it without leaving behind him or her distinct and legitimate reasons for having passed through it. How far you go in life depends on your being tender with the young, tender with the young. You notice ACU, we were very tender with you, isn't it? We told you to go and get free tea and free bank. Tender with the young. Compassionate with the aged. So those of us whose uh, memories are disappearing, be compassionate with us. Sympathetic with the striving. Those that are struggling in, in life, be sympathetic with them and tolerant with the weak and the strong because someday in life you will have been all of these. Now, since George Washington Tabor was a lecturer, this is what he used to tell the students. Learn to do common things and commonly well. So those of you who are at SU, when you are given an opportunity to clean the ablution blocks, learn to do common things and commonly well. When you are asked to sweep the classrooms, learn to do common things and commonly well. When you are asked to lead, Learn to do common things and commonly well. This is the ethos that this man whom we are learning used. His motivation for people is this. He loved everyone because he saw in everyone an expression, a manifestation of God. Remember, you've been following the presentation, he is growing up at a time when racism is at its highest. He's growing at a time when he has a desire to go to a university, but because of his skin color, he is not allowed to go there. But irrespective of whether you were black or white, his ethos in terms of motivation for love of people, he loved everyone because he saw in everyone an expression, a manifestation of God. To be successful in life demands and requires, to be fruitful rather in life, demands and requires that first and foremost, you have a biblical worldview of the world in which God has placed you. And to have a right relationship with God you will be seeing things from the lens of God's point of view, as opposed from your own fallen nature. One young man followed me outside and asked, you have taught us a new word, curiosity. I want to repeat, there is decent curiosity, and there is indecent curiosity. But I want to add that indecent curiosity is actually an offense in the penal code. Indecent curiosity is a crime. Indecent curiosity will lead you to hell. Decent curiosity will lead you to a fruitful life. With those words, let me call again uh, our pastor, Conrad Mbewe, to come and continue his presentation. I thank you. Right, so <clears throat> what we will do in this uh, second session is uh, we will 
make our way through his teaching career when he moved to uh, Tuskegee uh, Institute. And then we will also look at the way in which his uh, Christian life um, impacted him as a scientist. So those are the two. And then we will go into that video. It will be a little shorter this time because it won't have all those introductory sections that uh, the last one had, after which uh, we will have our lunch break. Let me mention that uh, after lunch, we come into a session where we break up into groups. And I have a number of questions. So when you break up into those groups, you choose uh, who your leaders will be, who your secretaries will be, and then you discuss. Uh, the reason behind that, and the reason why I'm saying it now rather than at the end, is because we are not wanting to just watch a movie. We are not admiring Superman or Spider-Man or Iron Man or whatever man, uh, Batman, and so on. That's not what we are doing. We are being challenged by another child of God. And when we go before God on the day of judgment, those are the kind of people he will put in front of us and say, okay, you are saying you could not be this because you had this impediment in your life. Well, look at this. And we will discover that we actually had no excuse. And so, we, it's good for us to be in a discussion session where we can speak about our challenges today relative to the challenges that uh, this gentleman had uh, covered and then say, okay, how did he overcome? How can we overcome today? So really, that's what that would be all about. Therefore, I really want you to be thinking as you are listening, thinking as you will watch the next segment of uh, this, so that you internalize what we are learning together. So in the second lecture, I'm dealing with uh, Carver as the Tuskegee instructor or lecturer. And um, we ended last time with... Um, him being invited to lecture at uh, Tuskegee um, Institute. And so I begin this session by saying that uh, in 1896, Carver got an invitation. So he has just graduated. He gets an invitation from Booker T. Washington to join Tuskegee Institute in South Alabama and especially or particularly to head its agricultural department. Since Booker T. Washington was to play a significant role in the life of Curver, let me say a little about him. Booker Taliaferro Washington, best known simply as Booker T. Washington, was born in 1856. He was slightly older than Curver. He was born into slavery, being the son of a slave woman on a plantation in southwest Virginia. However, he benefited from the emancipation laws that were passed in 1865. We've talked about what happened in the southern states earlier. Like Carver, he taught himself to read and went to school. He paid his way to seminary in Washington, D.C. in 1878. In 1881, that's three years later, at the age of 25, he became the founding leader 
of the Tuskegee Institute. Now, let me try and get this across to you. Is anybody here at the age of 25? Just stand up for us, if you're 25 years old. There we are. Thank you, thank you. People tend to be too hesitant. So, what, the reason why I've asked them to stand up is I want you to imagine these three friends of ours starting a college. Okay, thank you for laughing. You may be seated. But that's exactly what happened to Booker T. Washington. That was his age when he started what became the most outstanding institution for learning for black Americans internationally. It was at that age. Um, he deliberately developed the school through the hard work of students upon founding it with the help of several financiers. So it wasn't his own money that he used. A number of people that were able to contribute finances are the ones that supported him when he began this um, institution. By the way, as I read this, bear in mind, African Christian University is fashioned after Tuskegee Institute. So what you I'll be reading here, those of you who are at SCU will be able to say, aha, yeah, that sounds like SCU. Yes, yes, sounds like SCU, and so on. Okay, even the looking for money. <laughs> because you, you are seeking to train those that otherwise would not be able to afford such an education. So he deliberately developed the school through the hard work of students, both males and females. Thus, the students learned a trade through hard work and academics. Washington led Tuskegee for more than 30 years and developed it into an internationally respected center of learning, staffed entirely by black administrators and faculty. Between 1890 and 1915, when Washington died, he was the leading voice for black Americans. Those years were referred to in black American history as the age of Booker T. Washington. He believed that the way the black Americans were to become equals with their white counterparts was by bettering themselves educationally and through entrepreneurship. Those two ways. Therefore, he mobilized the middle class blacks together with church leaders and white philanthropists. Now, that simply means the whites who had large pockets and large hearts, okay? The two together. And also the politicians to build a strong economic base for blacks mainly in the South. Presidents listened to him because of his influence and the respect he commanded. This is the man who invited Carver to come and work with him in the early years of Tuskegee Institute because he wanted the best possible lecturer to lead the new agricultural school and agricultural experiment station. It was the invitation of Washington that Carver finally accepted when he graduated with his master's degree because he saw that he was one institution that was really meeting the needs of blacks in the South. And remember that lady who told him to follow the example of Libby. It was still on his mind. 
To borrow his own words, that is uh, Kurt Carver's words, he said he was following God's will to be of the greatest good for the greatest number of my people possible. The greatest good for the greatest number of my people possible. Although initially intending to be there for only a short time and then proceed to do his PhD studies, Carver ended up teaching there for 47 years and developed this into a strong research center. When he got there, he was shocked to find the state in which the institution and the entire area was compared to where he was coming from in Iowa. Everything appeared to be in a poor state. The buildings, the land, the animals, the people, everything was in a very poor state. Upon arrival, the other disappointment that Carver had was that he was expecting to find a well-equipped laboratory so that he could get on with his work. To his utter surprise, there was nothing like that. There was a room, and yeah, see what you can do over there. The institution, you have to accept, had only been started by Booker T. Washington about 15 years earlier. So it was still very much in its earlier stages. But what Carver appreciated the most was the strong work ethic that was in the college. The idea of the college was to train students and everyone else in the community to become self-sufficient. So the college was literally built by students. The bricks were molded by students. The wood was cut by students. The buildings were erected with the help of the students. The students actually managed the institution, the college. Carver readily joined with these mundane activities. He helped with painting walls. He helped counting the chickens on the farm like everybody else. It was a difficult adjustment, but he did, he did what he could to become part of the culture of the college. Carver also participated in setting up a laboratory by using all kinds of items that he could pick up in the junkyards in the rural neighborhood where he was among the farms. He had to be creative and innovative because there was no luxury of funds to purchase any state-of-the-art laboratory equipment. Washington favored Carver when he lured him into Tuskegee in 1896. He was given an above-average salary and a double room as his living quarters when all the other single lecturers shared one room between two of them. Some of the other faculty members resented this. Some lecturers perceived Carver as arrogant because he had been trained in a white institution. It was not long, however, before even Carver and Washington clashed. Mm, and it was especially because both of them were very strong characters. And one area in which they differed was in the allocation of funds in the institution. 
There were several times when Washington turned down Carver's requests for funds to put up a new laboratory or to purchase new supplies to feed into his experiments. Carver was also given the responsibility of raising funds for the institute through cultivating and then selling farm produce from the agricultural experiment station farms. He found this tedious and he complained about it. He, he, he wanted to be in the laboratory doing experiments. Administration was definitely not his strength. In 1904, Carver was accused by an institute committee that he had been exaggerating figures of poultry yields in terms of chickens, um, what was coming from the chicken farms. When Washington confronted Carver about this, the latter replied in writing, now, to be branded, I'm quoting here now, his reply. To be branded as a liar and party to such hellish deception, it is more than I can bear. And if your committee feel that I have willfully lied and was party to such lies as we're told, as we're told, my resignation is at your disposal. End of quote. It is said that this was not the only time that Carver threatened to resign when there was a clash between these two giants. This happened when his department was reorganized by management. He didn't like the fact that his management moved in in order to reorganize his department. It was also, he also threatened to resign when he did not like a teaching schedule that he was given. Again, management came up with a teaching schedule, and when he didn't like the schedule, he threatened to resign. Or when he was assigned some off-campus responsibility, again, he, something he didn't like. He threatened to resign. Or when he was denied summer teaching opportunities. Again, the same thing. However, Washington did the best that he could to keep cover. This did not mean he glossed over cover's weaknesses. Whereas he praised Carver for his research and teaching abilities, Washington once wrote to Carver, and let me quote what he said to him. When it comes to the organization of classes, the ability required to secure a properly organized and large school or section of a school, you are Wanting, simply an older word for lacking. So I'll use the, the more modern word. You are lacking in ability. In other words, you fail. When it comes to the matter of practical farm management, which will secure definite, practical, financial results, you are wanting again in ability. In other words, you are lacking in ability. In other words, you fail again. However, instead of going their separate ways, these two men developed a strong respect and admiration for each other. In 1911, Washington wrote about Carver, and listen to this. He is one of the most thoroughly scientific men of 
the Negro race with whom I am acquainted. End of quote. Washington died in 1915. Cover died in 1943, which is almost 30 years later. He was buried next to Washington, the Tuskegee grounds. You can see how these two lives functioned together. Well, let's move on. Booker T. Washington also urged his faculty to go into the community and introduce themselves to the people so that they could serve them and help them become self-sufficient. That was how he himself did. And so he urged his fellow lecturers to do the same. Carver gladly obliged and went out to introduce himself to the farmers in these poor rural communities. He advised the farmers as he saw how they were working. Urged along by Washington, he published experimental agricultural bulletins which he circulated among the local farmers. They dealt with basic issues in simple language. Issues such as planting, fertilizing, crop rotation, preserving the farm produce in terms of storing it, and so on all those very practical issues. He, uh, sorry, the pamphlets helped the farmers a long way because they explained procedures step by step. It was at the level of the local uneducated farmers. He introduced several alternative cash crops to the farmers to help them get more income and become more self-sufficient. These new crops helped to improve the soil that had been heavily cultivated by the growing of cotton. At that point, cotton was the main crop in the southern states of America. He also taught them new farming techniques that were more efficient. In fact, in 1914 to 1915, the boll weevil came across from Mexico into Alabama and almost eliminated cotton in the fields. Carver encouraged farmers to get into other cash crops he had been marketing to them. And, thus, and this expanded rather than decimated agriculture in the South. It was also around this time that he developed his crop rotation method to improve yields in the farms. Now, I need to say, uh, although he did not invent crop rotation, it has since been discovered in other parts of the world, but he popularized it among the farmers. We'll come and talk about that again in a moment. Carver also invented a mobile classroom and laboratory, which uh, I thought was, have we already passed it? We have, okay. Um, that was pulled by a horse. He called it the Jessup wagon because he secured funding for the wagon and the program from a wealthy philanthropist in New York called Morris Ketchum Jessup. Thus, Carver could go out into the community and demonstrate to the farmers what he had previously only been able to teach them. That was how committed Carver was to helping people. Carver was a Christian. In a letter to a friend, 
Isabel Coleman on July 24, 1931, he recalled how he became a Christian. Let me read the section of that letter to you. He says, I was just a mere boy when converted, hardly 10 years old. There isn't much of a story to it. God just came into my heart one afternoon when I was alone in the loft of our big barn when I was shelling corn to carry to the mill to be ground into meal. A dear little white boy, one of our neighbors about my age, came by one Saturday morning. And in talking and playing, he told me he was going to Sunday school tomorrow morning. I was eager to know what a Sunday school was. He said they sang hymns and prayed. I asked him what prayer was and what they said. I do not remember what he said. I only remember that as soon as he left, I climbed up into the loft, knelt down by the barrel of corn, and prayed as best as I could. I do not remember what I said. I only recall that I felt so good that I prayed several times before I quit. My brother and myself were the only colored children in that neighborhood. And of course, we could not go to church or Sunday school or any school of any kind. That was my simple conversion, and I have tried to keep the faith. Carver took his Christian faith seriously. This was what drove him in his work as a scientist. He believed that God made the whole of nature and he, God imbued it with laws. His job was, with the help of the creator, to discover those laws and use them to better the lives of people and to take care of creation itself. He once said, I go into my laboratory alone with the great creator. Thus, while he was teaching his students, Carver continued his experiments. He loved nature. He talked with plants as he got samples from them. Many people could not understand how a scientist could approach his work so religiously. He always spoke about God in his lectures. In November 1924, he was criticized in a newspaper for his religious faith that was mixed with his work as a scientist. And one way in which Carver survived those criticisms in the media and also from other scientists was by being in fellowship with other believers. This strengthened him. A student asked Carver to start a Bible study on campus on Sundays. He agreed to do so. The Bible study grew from 50 students to over 150 students until there was no room and students were standing outside to hear him teach. In one letter to a friend, Carver wrote these words, Oh, how I want them, referring to the students, to get the fullest measure of happiness and success out of life. I want them to see the great creator in the smallest 
and apparently most insignificant things around them. How I long for each one to walk and talk with the great creator through the things he has created. The lives of the students were transformed by this man. Let me end with an excerpt from a thank you note that Carver wrote to members of his senior class at the Tuskegee Institute. He wrote, and I quote, it is needless for me to keep saying, I hope, except for emphasis, that each one of my children, and by children, he's referring to the students. He, he never married, by the way, so he had no children. Will rise to the full height of your possibilities. Which means the possession of these eight cardinal virtues which constitute a lady or a gentleman. Number one, be clean both inside and out. Number two, neither look up to the rich or down on the poor. Number three, lose if need be without squealing. Number four, win without bragging. Number five, always be considerate of women children, and older people. Number six, be too brave to lie. Number seven, be too generous to cheat. And number eight, take your share of the world and let others take theirs. May God help you carry out these eight cardinal virtues and peace and prosperity by yours through life. End of quote. Carter treated his students like his children. He referred to former students as my dear boy and corresponded with them for many years, giving them counsel about life. Well, let's watch the next roughly 10 to 15 minutes of uh, our video before we reach the, the last part of the lecture. With great anticipation, Carver embarked on his initial journey into the Deep South. Willing to set aside other alluring offers, with great anticipation, Carver embarked on his initial journey into the Deep South.
he was a bit taken aback. He said, everything looked poor. The ground looked poor. The cattle looked poor. The people looked poor. The soil looked poor. Although Tuskegee had been founded 15 years earlier in 1881, Carver encountered an environment that was still in a formative state. The conditions would initially test his character. But in short order, he came to see that at the very heart of the Tuskegee experience was an infectious resourcefulness. The bricks were made by students. They were they're handmade bricks. The wood was cut from forest land that the university owned. It was milled on the university land, and it was built by students. Carver had been persuaded to join the effort at Tuskegee by one of the brightest visionary minds of the era, the energetic Booker T. Washington. The coupling of these two strong personalities was not always harmonious. They clashed on allocation of resources and other similar matters, but each carried strong admiration for the other. Washington drove everyone at school just like he drove himself, which was hard and all the time. Most everybody else took it in stride as part of the process of being a teacher or being a student at Tuskegee. While the two of them were passionate in their desire to help blacks and educate them, Carver and Washington were very different people. This difference caused a lot of friction. Carver skipped his own graduation from graduate school to get to Tuskegee in time for classes to start. He had thought he was coming there to have a fully equipped laboratory to continue with his research into botany and perhaps to continue with his painting. But when he arrived there, he found none of these things. Imagine how George would have felt. He left this very fine, uh, very well-equipped institution, and he went to a place where they were still working on it. Tuskegee was a very practical place. It was a place where real world things had to be done and people had to get them done. And Carver was, was put into an environment he had never been in before. He was put in an environment where he had to do uh, mundane things like counting chickens and putting whitewash on the fences and seeing, seeing to the everyday uh, tasks that had to be done in the area that he was in charge of. It took Carver a while to get adjusted to this, to the extent he ever got adjusted. Carver's frustration over the lack of resources was assuaged by the vision being cast by Washington. Encouraged to do so by Washington, Carver began in earnest to harness his own natural resourcefulness. They went out to the junkyards and they went door to door to get old cast off things that might be converted into laboratory equipment. If he needed some glassware, he would pick up a whiskey bottle. He would soak the bottle in ice water, then tie a string around it. He would set the string on fire. It would break the bottle into two pieces and he would have a funnel and a beaker. Carver was quickly captured by the unique opportunities present at Tuskegee. The ideal of Tuskegee was to help everyone become more self-sufficient. When Booker T. Washington came here to Tuskegee, one of the first things that he did was he went out into the community to introduce himself. He got to know the farmer. Booker T. Washington encouraged all of his teachers to go out into these rural areas. Carver was a part of it. Carver would take a horse and go out into these rural communities on Sundays and see how these folks were living and offered them advice. Washington encouraged Carver to develop a very practical written guide for local agrarians. The result was a tool that became a welcome asset for people working the land around Tuskegee. One of the most useful things that Carver did in his time at Tuskegee was publish what were called experimental agricultural bulletins. And they're wonderful little bulletins on preserving foods, canning foods, about planting, about fertilizer, about storage. What Carver was able to do is explain them in simple step-by-step -step components that the one-horse farmer could understand and could apply. 
the reception to the pamphlets Carver created gave flight to the vision of another method for equipping area farmers with the knowledge they needed to become increasingly self-sufficient. Carver actually sketched what the wagon should look like. Booker T. Washington secured funds from a wealthy New Yorker by the name of Morris Jessup. This was basically a portable classroom, a wagon on wheels that was pulled by a mule that was actually taken out into the field where the farmers were and could demonstrate to them techniques and bring them seed samples, bring them diagrams. They wanted to improve the quality of lives of people. And it wasn't just the black sharecroppers, it was the white sharecroppers. There wasn't any distinction with Booker T. Washington or Carver on who would benefit from the knowledge of the Institute. They wanted to help people. While Carver was pouring into the lives of local farmers, his love for the created order found in science was especially evident to his students. His mind would go like a ticking of a clock. Interested in everything. He called for me one Saturday and wanted me to go with him and to bring my camera. And I did. And we walked through the woods about 15 miles. And he was talking to the plants. He would break a twig and get the nectar out of it. And because this is bitter, no, 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 this is not it, this is not it. He loved the, the beauty of the earth and God's handiwork in all things. Carver's renown as a scientist grew, but he did have his detractors. In November of 1924, the New York Times published an article entitled, Men of Science Never Talk That Way, criticizing Carver's statements about God and science. Carver was undeterred. Unlike most scientific people, Carver did not depend on the scientific method or any kind of formalized procedures. He depended a lot on his intuition and also what he called divine inspiration. He believed that God would unlock the secrets of creation to people who ask for them, who look for them. I've heard him say that he had visions and they were so plain that he would get out of bed and make notation of what he had dreamed. For Carver, the worlds of science and creation were beautifully and inexorably linked. Dr. Carver was a man of devout faith. You can't read his letters, his correspondence, uh, pick up on his radio interviews without having him speak of God in his life. He put that in the forefront of his lectures, actually. A student asked him if he wouldn't start leading a Bible study. At first, about 50 students would turn up for it. Then, as word spread, more and more students would come so that after a while, students would jam 150 people into this room. People would stand outside the windows when there wasn't enough room. In a letter to a friend, Carver wrote this about his students. Oh, how I want them to get the fullest measure of happiness and success out of life. I want them to see the great creator in the smallest and apparently the most insignificant things about them. How I long for each one to walk and talk with the great creator through the things he has created. My life was changed completely by meeting Dr. Carver. When I got there at uh, Tuskegee, we got into conversation. He wanted to know everything about my home life. Why did I come to Tuskegee? Carver pushed his students toward academic excellence. He said, 99% of failures come from people who have the habit of making excuses. But more important to him was the list he compiled of eight cardinal virtues for his students to emulate and strive toward. Be clean, both inside and out. Neither look up to the rich nor down on the poor. 
Lose, if need be, without squealing. Win without bragging. Always be considerate of women, children, and older people. Be too brave to lie. Be too generous to cheat. Take your share of the world and let others take theirs. George, I believe, always knew the importance of mentors. He saw them in his own life, and he knew the effect that they could have on the lives of, of any number of individuals. Carver had a knack about him of picking out uh, young men that seemed like they might have potential. Because if you go back and look at all of the individuals he worked with all across the nation, from the YMCA's, uh, he would write to them. And he'd always start his letter off, because I got one at home, my dear boy. It's not my letter, it's my dad's letter. But he, all of them, and I thought it was something special when I wrote it, I said, hey, he said, my dear boy. But he wrote that to all of those that he saw something in and he began to work with. When you think about where Carver came from, he grew up, he was, you know, it was just him. You know, he, and he went on, he didn't have a family around him. And I think wherever he went, he pretty much um, was adopted and he adopted people. And I think he tried to provide them a family atmosphere. Carver's commitment to edify his students with life wisdom was untiring. He wrote, there is no shortcut to achievement. Life requires thorough preparation. Veneer isn't worth anything. He told them, it's not the style of clothes one wears, neither the kind of automobile one drives, nor the amount of money one has in the bank that counts. These mean nothing. It is simply service that measures success. His earnest challenge to them, fear of something, is at the root of hate for others, and hate within will eventually destroy the hater. He corresponded with these young men years and years and years. I really became like a father-son relationship in many, many ways. His students at Tuskegee remembered him all their lives as one of the primary influences in their life that molded their future and further careers just by what he told them, the counsel that he gave them. I've spent a lot of time with Dr. Carver just talking, and he said, help your neighbor. Who is your neighbor? He would say, anyone that need help. That's your neighbor. This was some advice that Carver wrote once. When our thoughts, which bring actions, are filled with hate against anyone, Negro or white, we are in a living hell. That is as real as hell will ever be. While hate for our fellow man puts us in a living hell, holding good thoughts for them brings us an opposite state of living, one of happiness, success, peace. We are then in heaven. As Carver's scientific contributions accumulated, another, perhaps greater gift, his charismatic enthusiasm, found an unexpected platform. The YMCA was working with the Commission on uh, He went through the cadet force, so that shouldn't be too difficult for him to handle. Thank you very much. to see first of all as this presentation was being made you'll notice that uh, the gentleman we're talking about George Washington Carver he's an ordinary person you will notice that uh, as the pastor was presenting there the things that happened to us uh, as we live with one another you you can't miss that there was some brushing isn't it with this man known as uh, Booker T Washington they, they were differing in the same way we differ isn't it so these are real people who knew exactly how not to lose their Christianity in their differences. Okay? I want to read again a 
like I told you, every session, I want to take advantage of his philosophy of life, which keeps unfolding as the presentation is being made. No individual has any right to come into this world and to go out of it without leaving behind him or her distinct and legitimate reasons for having passed through it. How far you go in life is now your attitude. How far you go in life depends on your being tender with the young, compassionate with the age, sympathetic with the striving, and tolerant with the weak and the strong, because some day in life you will have been all of these. You will notice that the, the struggle that Booker T. Washington and uh, Kava were having, you can't miss his Christianity. Later on, as the presentation is being made, you will find that when Booker T. Washington's wife died, he writes a very sympathetic and empathetic letter to his wife, having appreciated uh, Booker T. Washington, having recognized the endured abilities that God had put on a person that they used to brush each other with, as it were, teaching us some very valuable lessons in interpersonal relationships. That the fact that we may differ does not necessarily mean that we are enemies. Okay? What I would like us to do during this uh, particular uh, session is that uh, I've asked uh, the pastor to sort of beam the, the questions uh, and then. Uh, I'll just ask him to come up again, just guide on how we will, uh, we will deal with the questions. The aspect of dividing you, don't worry, we will be able to find out the formula. In fact, the division has already been done. When I look here, I can say this is group, group number one here, two. We're just looking at the number. Yeah, that's the way we go. This one, two thing, tends to sometimes you find that you say count up to three find people start counting up to four. So to avoid that, we will just say actually four. Yeah. So, Pastor, can I ask that you come and do some magic uh, with the, yeah, through the uh, system. So, um, what I will do is that uh, since when you say volunteers, they don't I'll basically just pick you. Once you are picked, you are the one who will lead that uh, group. Uh, the singer there in that white t-shirt, uh, please come to the front. And there's no saying no. You know, once you have been picked, that's it. There's no no here, no. Me, I don't have the ability to write. To read. No. Just there. Yeah, okay, just here. Ah, so, yeah. So you can keep standing. This group here... Let me look for a young man. Uh, here, this man with the sweater there. You yourself, the one looking behind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You. Uh -huh. You, you, you have been picked. Yeah, you have been picked. You have been. 